to do. <laughs> I'm going to tell you why you should be an anarchist. I'm going to give you four reasons to be an anarchist. For some of you, these will be reasons to become an anarchist. For others, will be reasons to congratulate yourselves on being one already. Then I'm going to tell you what kind of anarchist to be. And then I'm going to tell you what to say to non-anarchists. Then I'll stop. Uh, oh, but first, um, <clears throat> Bit Body asked me to say something about who I am. So, my name is Roderick Long. I teach philosophy at Auburn University. Um, I'm involved with the, the Center for a Stateless Society, which is uh, going to have a table uh, exhibiting here um, sometime within the next hour or two. Um, Google me. Uh, okay, so uh, why should we have four reasons? First reason. Uh, Nobody has any business uh, claiming for themselves a right that they deny to other people. Government by its nature does this, because government, even the best, most minimal, most libertarian government you can imagine, claims for itself a right to impose certain legal standards within a certain geographical territory that denies to other people in that territory. Now, if the services it's providing are legitimate services, then there's no reason that they should be able to deny the right to anyone else to do it. If something is legitimate to do, it's legitimate for anyone to do it. If it's not legitimate for anyone to do it, it's not legitimate for them to do it either. So, <clears throat> claiming a, a course of territorial monopoly is a violation of basic human equality. <clears throat> second, uh, second reason to be uh, an anarchist is uh, monopolies have incentive problems. When you're a monopoly, when you are able to prevent your customers from uh, switching to uh, the competitor, then okay, we all know basic economics that there's an incentive for costs to go up, for service quality to go down, for this monopoly status to be abused. After all, one of the checks on prices going up and the service quality going down is the threat that your customers will switch to a competitor. If no one's allowed to compete with you, then you should expect to, you should expect the, the charge for the services to go up. So even if you've got, you know, well, at least initially a nice minimal libertarian government, the, uh, the incentive is going to be for it to, to grow, for its, uh, its charges to become higher, and for its quality to get worse, and for it to abuse its power, and when governments abuse their power, pretty seriously bad things happen. Uh, you get you get piles of dead bodies. Uh, we're not talking about you know problems of uh, you know, just you know, senators uh, charging their their lunches to the government or something like that. You, know, you get wars. You get massive special interests, and so on. Third, even if you could somehow manage to get the nicest, wisest, most virtuous people in charge of the government. So you wouldn't have to worry about the uh, incentive problem. Because you, you found some incorruptible people to run the thing. There's going to be an informational problem, which is even if you've got the, you know, the best intentions in the world, you don't really have, without a price system, without a market competition, without this kind of that feedback, you really don't have a good idea how, you know, how well you're doing. Now, so suppose that You've got a monopoly in anything else. You've got a monopoly in shoes. You're the only person allowed to make shoes. And suppose that although you're tempted to exploit the monopoly position and charge really high prices for your shoes and really charge equality for them, uh, you're really nice and decide not to do that. But then how do you know whether you're doing the best service, whether you're providing the best shoes? Um, you, know, you can poll people and say, well, how do you like the monopoly shoe company? And they say something like, well, I guess it's OK. What do you do? Uh, yeah, without feedback, without competition, it's the discovery process, you don't really know what you're doing. So even if you could somehow manage to get an incorruptible government, there'd still be a problem informationally as to uh, how we would have a good uh, idea of what it's doing. Fourth, here's another reason to be an anarchist. If you simply want to get to a free society, anarchy is easier to achieve than a minimal state. That might sound surprising. You would think that 
And the more radical something is, the harder it is to achieve it. In fact, you often hear people say things like, well, you know, anarchists and anarchists are working together, working toward, you know, in going in the same direction. So you say this metaphor, yeah, we're both on the same train, one of us gets off on stop before the other. Uh, so you know, we're doing the same things. It's like we want to reduce government down, 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 and then the anarchist goes one step farther. So it seems as though the anarchist is uh, doing something harder, you know, doing something very similar to the harder than the anarchist is doing. So I don't think that's the right way to think about it. Here's one. Anarchy is the only political position that can triumph without its proponents having to take over the state apparatus. Every other political reform you want to produce, uh, whether you want uh, socialism, fascism, libertarianism, uh, of the minarchist variety, whatever it is you want, you're going to have to get people in power you know, by getting them elected, or by converting people who are already in power, or uh, by violent revolution or whatever it is, you get you get people with your ideas in charge of the state. <coughs> and one thing that means is there's no such thing as a partial or gradual victory. Uh, if you win 49 percent of the vote in some nationwide election, um, that's a complete loss. You don't get, especially in a political system like the U.S., you don't get the elect. Um, whereas uh, the there's a, there is a, no, you can try to pursue anarchy in the same way, try to get people elected in power. And I'm not necessarily against that. I'm not one of the, you know, the hardline people who say that, uh, that political electoral politics is you know, completely you know, forbidden, that it's totally unclean, it should never be touched. That's not my view. But I think there's a reason to think it doesn't need to be and shouldn't be the central focus. Because government is one of those problems where if you ignore it, it really will go away. The problem is that you know, if you just as an individual ignore it, it's not going to go away. But if enough people ignore it, it does go away. Um, because you know, government doesn't have any power other than if the power gets from law, it's all obeyed. So there's an alternative strategy for achieving uh, uh, anarchy, the strategy of building alternative institutions, gradually getting people to withdraw consent from government, and so forth until the government just goes away. Now, I'm not saying that's easy. I'm just pointing out that it is, it is a strategy that's open to you if you're an anarchist. That's not open to you if your policy is something that involves the state doing something, bothering you. And this is part of the reason we have a uh, problem with this idea that, that the anarchists and the anarchists are on the same train, but they, uh, that one of them gets off uh, before the other one. Think about it this way. Think of government doing like this. At the core, there are these basic course of forces it has. It has the police and the army and so forth. That whole administration and apparatus of coercion. Then on top of that, above all that, it's got all the particular policies it does of regulating this and taxing that and enforcing this and subsidizing that and all those various stuff that it does. And the the model that sees the anarchists and anarchists as, as traveling the same train together says basically, well, look, here's what we're both doing. The anarchists and anarchists both get there together and they start sort of snipping at these branches. You know, snip off this tax and this subsidy and this regulation, and, uh, this policy, and you guys just snip, snip, snip until you get down to just the core root. At that point, the minute it stops and the anarchist goes one step further. Um, however, from an anarchist standpoint, that's not necessarily the way we think about it. You might think, well, look, if we, attack, if we attack the thing the minarchist doesn't want to attack, this core root, the basic sort of police and army structure, if you've got rid of that, all the rest of it, you don't have to fuss with all the rest of it. All the rest of it depends on the basic course of apparatus. The one part that the minarchist wants to keep, if you're an anarchist, you just attack that. I say just attack that, but it's easy. But I'm just pointing out that it's, you know, there's a strategy that's open to the anarchist that isn't open uh, to the minarchist of simply trying to withdraw consent. And there's a nice example I got from uh, Charles Johnson. Uh, he says, well, if you want to compare the strategy of, of withdrawing consent uh, from government and sort of bypassing it with the strategy of reforming it, think about immigration reform. Think of the various attempts to reform immigration through political channels. 
How many immigrants have they managed to get in the country by doing this? Zero. Uh, how many immigrants have people managed to get in the country by bypassing or ignoring government laws? Well, quite a lot. So uh, there's an example of how uh, you can have uh, you can have a bigger impact this way. And that's because there's such a thing as degrees of success with the uh, with the anarchist model. Uh, you don't have to have the all or nothing. Either the government repeals this law or it doesn't repeal this law. That's a, you know, that's all or nothing. And if you don't manage to get it repealed, then no matter how much success you have building a movement to get it repealed, as long as it doesn't actually get repealed, your success in some sense is most zero. Whereas if you actually uh, you know, work to uh, you know, build resistance within the system, you can actually you know, have degrees of success. And so the way it's, it's, uh, it looks better for morale as well. Now, I don't draw the conclusion, as some of my friends do, that you should repudiate electoral politics entirely. Uh, I think it's useful for certain purposes. In particular, it could be useful to have some of our people on the inside of the state apparatus when you know, if you get to the point where uh, we begin to have significant impact against the state, we may be able to have you know, some control on how nasty the state's reaction to us is if we've got some people on the inside. So I'm not against it, I just think it should be the focus. Okay, those are four reasons to be an anarchist. What kind of anarchist should you be? Well, I think that there are broadly three kinds of anarchists. And I say broadly because actually it's surprisingly hard to fit real life prominent examples of anarchists, either contemporary or historical, into these slots. You might think you know, you know who fits into which slot. You actually start looking at the writings, it could be some slippage. But so broadly speaking, at one end you've got uh, the, a tradition of anarchism that's anti-market. It's a tradition that thinks of uh, of commerce and exchange is being inherently exploited. And I think there's a lot of value you can learn from anarchists of that strike. I don't think we should just dismiss them. There's a lot of value in their writings. But I think there's a fundamental misunderstanding there. Uh, they are, I think, in most of these cases, they are identifying some genuine problem, but they misidentify the cause. They make the mistake of thinking that the cause is, is markets or exchange or private ownership. Um, when most of the problems that they point to are actually the results of systematic government intervention uh, in the market. Uh, to be an anarchist, but to be against markets, is I think to be against the chief voluntary form of the maintenance of social order. The, the anarchy and the free market are made for each other. For anarchists to reject the free market, uh, or for free marketers to reject anarchy, I think either one is, is a disaster. Uh, there's another kind of uh, uh, anarchy, which, again, I think has a lot of uh, value and you know, lots of very proponents of it, um, but which I think there's a problem with. There's a version of anarchy that sees the anarchist market as being basically like the market we have today, only without the state. So basically, uh, a market dominated by large hierarchical corporations and so forth. Um, and the ordinary conditions of work would be very similar to what they are today, but without the market. And I think that's, that's wrong in two ways. First, I think it's, it's a mistake. I think it underestimates the extent to which the existing uh, market conditions are shaped by uh, uh, what uh, government does, various ways in which government intervenes in such a way as to make, as to reap competition in the direction of supporting these kinds of big corporations at the expense of smaller outfits, uh, self-employment, uh, workers' cooperatives, and so on. So a lot of those things that the, the left like, I think they're right to like, but they're wrong to see the free market as the, um, as the uh, enemy of them. But also, I think just in terms of, of uh, selling our ideas, uh, we're not going to be as successful if we market uh, as simply, well, it's the kind of corporate-dominated economy we've already got and without the government. Uh, it's not going to, uh, yeah, it's not going to be that good selling point. So, uh, so that's why I favor the what we call third kind of anarchy, uh, sometimes called uh, left libertarian free market anarchy or free market anti capitalism, or whatever you want to do it. If you Google those phrases, you'll find the stuff that I'm uh, talking about. All right, what is the one 
Uh, what's the I'm going to say is the answer? What's, what you should say in non etiquettes? Well, I think that there is a general answer. I mean, you have to get into more particular details, but there's a general answer to 90% of the questions that an online anarchist sways will ask you. When they ask, well, how would this get done, or how would that happen, or what about this problem, and so forth? Uh, yeah. How would how would roads get done? How would people get educated? How would uh, uh, police protection be provided, and so forth? And the answer is always, how is it done now? There is a tendency to assume that government has some kind of magic power, that because government is doing something, uh, government somehow has some ability to make things happen that ordinary people don't. But the people running government are not Superman. They don't have any special power of their own. Um, the very fact that it makes government easier to overthrow is also what makes it uh, you know, less needful to have it. Uh, you know, we actually had a government that was run by Superman, so Superman, he could, by his own individual force, could enforce all his edicts. Well, then we would really be screwed. But so far, we have not. I mean, General Zod hasn't come to Earth. Um, if he does, it's going to be tough for the activists. But, uh, by and large, you know, government doesn't have any, you know, the people who, who, who rule us are a minority of the population. They can't, by their own personal life, make things happen. Things happen because we go along. The government doesn't have any money of its own. The money it has, it gets from us. So, if we've got the, we've got the ability to build roads, we've got the ability to, uh, uh, to trade with each other and produce goods and services, uh, what do we do the government for? Um, yeah, I, yeah. So anyway, you have to say, you know, in answer critics, you have to go into more detail than that, but I think that's a general outline of the, uh, of the kind of answer you want to give. Is to say that, you know, there's a sense in which anarchy is the chief social, source of social order right now. You know, most social order right now is produced by voluntary interactions. And government is sort of a parasite on them, sort of throwing molasses in the gears, trying to slow things down. But, in fact, you know, how did we all get here? We all got here by anarchistic means. No one put a gun to your head and forced you to come here. Uh, well, maybe someone, um, I don't know, uh, <laughs> some of our more enthusiastic guys uh, may have done, but by and large, not, not the case. We all coordinated uh, voluntarily to come here. Um, so there's a nice line from uh, the uh, English anarchist Colin Ward. Anarchy is the cement that holds society together. I think it's a nice line to use when people start talking about anarchists in chaos or something like that. Okay, questions. We've got a little time for questions. Yes? A continental defense from external threats. If you have a large territory and uh, you need a massive spending because there, let's say, assume that there's an attack coming from a foreign place and uh, so some people just want to contribute because everybody else is expecting everybody else to Okay, so the question is, what about continental defense uh, from foreign threats? Uh, how could anarchy handle that? Well, there's a notion of continental defense is a lot. I and mean, we tend to think of, of national, what we call national defense as this big bundle where, uh, you know, saving, you know, protecting Maine and protecting California are both part of the same bundle. Well, clearly, there's no particular reason that protecting Maine and protecting California are part of the same bundle. Now, obviously, you know, protecting your house, protecting your neighbor's house kind of have to be part of the same bundle. So this is public goods aspect to it, but certainly not really continent uh, wide. And again, um, how does government do it? Government doesn't have um, does government doesn't have any magic powers. Now of course there is this public goods problem, but markets create incentives to solve public goods problems. Uh, you know, every so-called public good has been provided one time or another by private enterprise, and people find ways of handling it. Um, Bundling the public good with some private good. Um, so you could uh, bundle the good you can't exclude people from with the good you can't exclude people from, and kind of both that way, the way that uh, the private lighthouses were traditionally funded. It's this argument you couldn't have private funded lighthouses because the light goes off to everyone, so those who pay and those who don't. Well, how did actually they have private lighthouses? Well, we paid for the lighthouse by you could exclude ships from the harbor. And you couldn't dock at the harbor just to pay the fee, and means that to be the lighthouse, because the harbor is not going to the lighthouse. Um, so, uh, you know, market speak the centers figure out how to solve these problems. Yes? In terms of the, uh, the definition of anarchy or anarchism, um, would you say that you think it means anything beyond simply the absence of government? And do you have any feeling as far as different camps of anarchists if they were defined as differently. Uh, I mean, you, you mentioned, you know, kind of anarchists on the left or anarchist syndicalists. You know, I, I haven't sort of gotten a, a clear definition from them, but I suspect they would say something, you know, slightly different. Yeah, 
And so the question is, uh, does anarchy just mean the rejection of, of the state, or does it mean other things as well? This is an issue anarchists have disagreed on. I mean, the rejection of the state is the one thing that all anarchists agree defines anarchism. But there's disputes as to whether that's all you need to be an anarchist. Uh, some anarchists will say that you need to reject all forms of, of illicit domination to be an anarchist. Uh, and others will say, no, it's just the state. That's one disagreement. The other disagreement is that which, you know, which things are illicit domination, which things are OK. In a way, I don't think that issue is that important, because I think anarchists should reject all forms of illicit domination. Whether they should do so by definition or not, I think it's less important. I think it's important for anarchists or libertarians you know, to follow opposed all kinds of uh, oppressive things, whether they're state-related or not. I think it makes sense, and those things are bad for some of the same reasons that states are bad. Uh, whether you bundle that into your definition uh, or not, I think it's, uh, is not as crucial. Um, I think it's important to understand which things are. I mean, there are you know, a lot of the left anarchists will say that, that uh, certain forms of market transaction are just by their nature inherently oppressive. And I think they're wrong about that. I think they've noticed various bad aspects of really existing ones, but they misidentified what the source of them is. Yeah? Uh, Somalia, ancient Ireland, ancient Iceland are often cited by people as the reasons why energy is not sustainable. Do you have a, a short response that I can throw at people when this, this topic come up? Okay, well, um, Somalia is a nasty place to live, but it was nastier when it had a government than it is now, and it is now, and it's, it's less nasty than a lot of its neighbors that uh, have governments. So, and there's an interesting article uh, about this by Benjamin Powell and a couple of other people. So if, you, if you Google Benjamin Powell and Somalia, you'll find uh, this article where it talks about, uh, about prosperity and peace actually being better in Somalia now than they were before and in these other countries. So, so, so anarchy does the best it can with the existing uh, economic and cultural and geographical uh, conditions. So I think Somalia is actually a success story. Now, if you can't compare Somalia with the US, then I prefer to live in the US. But it's not that that's a fair comparison. As for ancient Ireland and, uh, and Iceland and so forth, I think those are good examples too. I mean, those are entities that collapsed. But the, the medieval, <laughs> Uh, Ireland, or sorry, the medieval Iceland example lasted longer than the U.S. has so far. Uh, you know, the medieval Icelandic anarchy, it wasn't the perfect anarchy, but uh, you know, it was pretty close. Medi the medieval I I I Icelandic anarchy lasted from 930 to 1262. So it lasted longer than the U.S. has so far. Now, it did eventually fail, but was every state system has eventually failed as well. There aren't any state systems that are around that are thousands of years old. Um, and likewise with the Irish system, I mean, yes, the, the English conquered it, but you know, it took a heck of a long time. And you know, I don't think the English succeeded in conquering it because it was an anarchy. The English conquered lots of places that weren't anarchies, and this England was, was good at conquering stuff. Uh, uh, anyway, so that's my short answer. And uh, let's see, how are we doing for time? Pardon? Okay, one last question. Um, yeah, I was curious how communal land would be administered in an anarchist state. Um, I was questioning how would communal land be administered in an anarchist state. I'm one of the few libertarians who think there would be such a thing as communal land. Um, how it would be administered? Well, basically, um, you know, the way that people agreed to. I mean, there would be there would be disagreements about land use, but in a supply society. They'd uh, it would be the incentive for them to resolve these through courts and arbitration rather than through uh, government force, uh, or rather than through private agency force, because private agency force is awfully expensive and you can't socialize the costs the way governments can. So I think that um, uh, we have, uh, okay. so if people disagree about land use, if people disagree about how to use it, well, it would get resolved through courts. Okay, last question. Okay, can I, I just wanted to mention that uh, not the, last, not the one who got it a week ago, but the Nobel laureate uh, Eleanor uh, Ostrom last year got it in part for uh, her work on governing the commons, showing how non-government local management of common core resources has worked in many different situations. She doesn't like it, but 
of the management of, of forests and uh, water areas that are shared. And so it's not governmental, but it's not you know private property, individual owner. Uh, still volunteer. Okay, so short summary of your comment. Uh, Eleanor Ostrom, who recently won a Nobel Prize, uh, has done work on uh, sort of informal mechanisms for governing uh, common land. And now I will divest myself of these two.